This video uh, is the ending of the lesson about cultural and religious upheavals in Europe during the Renaissance. And uh, the last point of these um, changes is the religious reformations in Europe, the part which will here be continued. So what was seen in the previous video was the um, reforms introduced by Martin Luther, uh, which basically created um, a new form of um, Christian church, which was not Catholic, so with no links to the popes. And um, I think it's important to have a look at the most important differences between Protestant religions uh, and the Catholic one. So, in this table you will find a summary of um, those contrasts. In the Catholic Church, uh, those elements were, were true in the 16th century and for most of them are still true today. Uh, the point of religion is um, uh, to obtain salvation for your soul when you die. And according to the Catholic Church, salvation should be reached through um, the fact of believing in God and all the Catholic creed. Uh, creed meaning uh, all the beliefs of a religion but faith only was not enough um, actions are also important uh, and uh, for the Catholic Church all these actions that a good Christian should do uh, to work on his salvation uh, are part of a, an attitude which is called doing penance uh, going on pilgrimage, for example, or um, buying indulgences in the 16th century were examples of these acts of penance that a Christian should do. And lastly, um, to be given the sacraments by priests at different moments of your life was also something seen as important. The first sacrament being baptism uh, for the newborn or for the newcomers in the religion and uh, you know the Eucharist uh, marriage or well, other examples of sacraments. Well uh, with Luther and the Protestant churches that were created uh, from this moment on, only faith was seen as necessary to reach uh, salvation. So what was faith based on? Uh, in the Catholic creed uh, the Bible was of obviously uh, the most important text but what the Catholics called the tradition which means all the decisions taken by the church later in its history uh, about beliefs was to be taken into consideration as well uh, for example uh, purgatory which is um, said to be a kind of transitory place in the afterlife between heaven and hell and where souls uh, can be um, uh, cleaned from their sins. This belief did not exist before uh, the end of the Middle Ages. It was a creation of the Catholic Church. It was an in introduction by the Catholic Church. So uh, for the Protestants uh, and Luther Everything which is not in the Bible should not be taken into account. So the Bible only is the basis of faith. The next point is about the organization of the church as a community. Uh, organization, hierarchy, uh, was a very important dimension in the Catholic Church. Uh, there is only one leader of the church, the Pope in Rome and uh, the clergy consists of monks and priests who had a special status uh, different from the common believers uh, were strictly organized you, you had bishops and priests for example in this hierarchy and they were considered as uh, you know mediators between God and man for the Protestants uh, there is not only one church. 
uh, many different communities can call themselves churches uh, and the Pope has absolutely no authority on them and priests do not exist strictly speaking uh, it is not a specific status to be a priest any believer any uh, faithful can serve as a minister uh, which is a function and not a status and so for example the, the protestant ministers uh, can marry which is an example of their you know the fact that they are more integrated into uh, social life than the priests uh, of the catholic church about ritual and rituals and ceremonies um, some characteristics of the catholic church were changed uh, all sacraments uh, of the catholic creed were rituals you know ceremonies like baptism or marriage and there were seven uh, in total and and these offices and in particular the mass you know the basic service in the catholic religion uh, could be and largely had to be in the 16th century uh, a very uh, solemn ceremony uh, often sumptuous and done in latin in churches that could be richly decorated not all churches but uh, and in particular during the 16th century very beautiful churches were built very beautiful in the sense that they they were full of arts of details that were supposed to be um, celebrations of the of the glory of god well on the protestant side the number of rituals was strictly reduced uh, only two sacraments baptism and eucharist which is the sharing of bread uh, during the mass uh, only these two were kept the mass had to be a, a more simple ceremony and very importantly it had to be delivered in common language so french in france and german in germany etc uh, and churches in, in most protestant religions could be uh, very poorly decorated uh, in fact um, the protestant temples uh, in the early days in particular were uh, purely and simply private houses uh, simply because this religion was often not accepted by the state and so uh, those uh, offices were organized secretly there is an expression uh, I, I think it's by Luther uh, which says which says that the the church I is not the building the church is inside the church and it's the people well uh, subsequently to luther's upheaval and his reform other religious reformations took place in europe and many of them had political impacts or were closely connected to politics the first example uh, i would like to develop is uh, the french example uh, which led to uh, decades of war and uh, was mostly due to uh, the spreading of the the teaching of a new reformer called Jean Calvin on this map of the Christian religion in Europe at the middle of the 16th century you can see in blue uh, how much the lutheran religion successfully spread in the north of europe from the the powerhouse of germany and wittenberg the city of luther what is notably remarkable is how uh, it spread in denmark and sweden these states in scandinavia became lutheran because the king or the prince at the head of each of these states decided so and so the lutheran religion became a state religion 
So it was the result of a political decision here. Often because these kings, for one reason or another, were in disagreement with the Pope, not on religious grounds, but mostly on political grounds. Um, you can see here uh, that in, uh, in pale yellow, uh, some areas had remained Catholics. Um, Italy, Spain and Portugal uh, have almost constantly remained strongly Catholic. This was where uh, the alliance between the political power and the Catholic Church was the strongest. And uh, this um, Catholic dimension, the Catholic identity has not been denied by history later. Uh, you can see that in Eastern Europe, Poland remained uh, a Catholic area uh, up to very contemporary times. And one of the uh, last popes, the last pope of the 20th century, uh, was from Poland. And you can see that in, uh, in many states, in many areas, um, Protestant churches emerged, but did not gain politically the leadership. It is the case of the religion of Jean Calvin, uh, whose uh, powerhouse was Geneva in Switzerland, and which is the form of Protestantism that spread in France. Some um, elements from Calvin's religion differed from uh, the religion of Luther, one in particular, which is the fact that for uh, the Calvinists, the people that would be saved, the soul that would be saved, were uh, chosen from the beginning by God. No matter what you do or no matter what you believe in, some souls will be saved and some will not. This is a, a concept that Calvin called predestination. And Calvin's Protestant churches were uh, remarkable by their very strict austerity. Uh, those people dressed in black uh, on the, this image of a Protestant temple in uh, Lyon, France, uh, illustrate this austerity. And you can see, by the way, in this temple, which is a, a simple, uh, well, not a simple, but uh, it, it's clearly less decorated than a Catholic building. Um, in this place, you can see no difference between any clergy or uh, the common believers. Okay, they all, most of them are dressed in black. Uh, it's the form of, of Protestant or reformed religion that spread in France uh, from the, the middle of the 16th century. French Protestants used to be named Huguenots. It's a term that is famous in England because many Huguenots uh, fled from France to find protection in England. And um, many different social categories in the French uh, population um, were attracted by uh, Protestantism. Uh, the proportion was low, something like 10% of the French, the rest remained Catholics. But the people that uh, turned Protestant did not belong to one specific social group. It could be very common and poor people, and it could also be uh, princes. The um, the geographical spreading of Protestantism was uh, very uneven. In any case, what is historically extremely important is that the spreading of Protestantism in France led to a major political crisis. In fact, the highest level of a political crisis, which is civil war. A civil war is when uh, two um, communities that belong to the same state, here France, fight against each other. 
and uh, the period known as the French Wars of Religion, which spread from 1562 to 1598, uh, was a long period of unrest marked by eight military wars. And uh, it, it had many political consequences in, in France. During this period, the French dynasty of kings changed. Uh, the family that used to rule France in those days was the Valois family. And uh, during the Catholic, uh, sorry, during the religious wars, at one point, King of France, Henry III, was assassinated. And his only possible successor was a prince called Henri de Navarre, who happened to be a Protestant. And so in order to solve this, uh, uh, this problem and to put an end to violence, you can see here an illustration of the most tragic and famous uh, episode of violence, uh, which was uh, a massacre of Protestant people uh, in Paris mostly, but of also in other cities of France on Saint Bartholomew's Day. 24th of August 1572. So I said in order to put an end to this unrest the Protestant Prince Henri de Navarre accepted to convert to Catholicism and so he became King Henry IV of France and he started a new uh, dynasty for the French monarchy the Bourbon dynasty uh, which will be extremely uh, important in the building of the French state. In fact, King Henry IV put an end to civil war in France by um, an edict called uh, the Edict of Nantes, which put an end to the last uh, war of religion in 1598. And basically, this edict uh, legalized uh, the presence of uh, the Huguenots, the French Protestants, in the Kingdom of France. Uh, they had freedom of conscience, they could follow their own religion, and uh, their presence in the state was tolerated, even though the state remained a Catholic state. Okay, that was the decisions made by King Henry uh, at the very end of the 16th century. And uh, another political consequence of these wars of religion is that it marked the beginning with Henry IV of the building of a stronger state in, in France, a strong state strictly governed uh, from uh, Paris, uh, which will have many consequences in the future. And of course, the other very important country that we must examine uh, is England. Uh, because there was also an English reformation, but it took a very specific uh, form and had incredibly huge political consequences. So it is a very famous uh, fact uh, that it's King Henry VIII of the Tudor dynasty that uh, made the decision in 1534 to break up with the Pope in Rome. The reason why he broke up with the Pope, and so because the king was the state, uh, England broke up with the Pope and the Catholic Church, was that he wanted to have a divorce from his uh, wife Catherine of Aragon because, uh, well, not only he did not like her, but in fact, this uh, uh, romantic aspect uh, is far from being the most important. It is because she would not give him a son. Okay, they did not manage to have uh, children, and in particular, not a son, because he wanted that for, you know, political reasons. He wanted a male successor. And so uh, his plan, which he eventually fulfilled, was to marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn, who was a Protestant, by the way. 
Uh, and so, uh, for this reason, he uh, created uh, a Church of England. Which means that at the head of this church, there was no pope anymore. It was not even a bishop at the head of this church. It was the king himself. It is very clearly shown on this um, engraving which was printed on the first page of the Bible in English that King Henry uh, had uh, published in England. Uh, you can see on this amazing drawing how the Church of England was organized with its priests and bishops but uh, on the throne bigger than God, you can see God at the very top of the picture here, but bigger than God he is King Henry VIII delivering to the priest and bishop the words of God. Uh, you can see he is holding books which read Verbum Dei, which means the words of God. And so it's really a national church. It is a political decision made by Henry VIII. Creating his own church meant increasing the king's power in England. And in fact, it, you, if we look at the bottom of this image, you can see English people, the common people, uh, saying something, chanting something, but it's not a religious praise of God whatsoever. It's viva trex, which means long live the king. Uh, you can even read God save the king in one of the captions. So this creation of the Church of England by King Henry VIII was clearly a political decision. Thomas Cromwell, a very faithful Protestant, was his chief minister. Under his uh, leadership, um, attacks against the Catholic Church were uh, very violent. In fact, uh, the, the belongings, the properties of the Catholic Church were either taken or destroyed. That's the reason why you can see in England some, well, very impressive ruins of um, Catholic uh, abbeys which were banned and destroyed and burned by the troops of the king. Uh, Tintern Abbey uh, in, in Wales and uh, Glastonbury Abbey in, in southwest England are good examples of that. In fact, Henry was not a Protestant himself. It is something which is uh, very impressive uh, in terms of beliefs. He, he remained a Catholic which was not the case of his successor. So King Edward VI, uh, who died very young, but under his reign, uh, he, all his advisors, many of his uh, ministers in government were, were devoted Protestants. And so they really made decisions in order to, to turn this Church of England into a genuinely Protestant Church. They decided that the Latin language was banned from the Mass, it, it had to be done in English, and more than this, a book of common prayer, uh, some kind of uh, simplified Bible if you want, written in English, was published by the state and, and uh, distributed all over the country. Priests were now allowed to marry and the Catholic churches uh, were turned into Protestant churches, notably by whitewashing the walls and removing all the decorations and details. Okay, uh, Some kind of, of violent, in a way, or at least brutal uh, policy. And Catholic bishops were imprisoned. So you see, uh, this reformation was imposed by force. But in fact, nothing is simple with the Tudor uh, dynasty, obviously. And uh, Edward VI success, Queen Mary I, was on the contrary a Catholic. And so during the few years of her reign, from 1553 to 15, 
1558, she reintroduced Catholicism in England. So anew, the Pope was at the head of this church because it was a Catholic church. The Latin language was reintroduced and the Protestants were now considered to be religious dissenters. Okay. Uh, they were uh, seen as dangerous and many of them, notably the, the important, the influential people, were burnt at the stake. So it was a very violent policy uh, which, um, which gave to Queen Mary the infamous nickname of Bloody Mary, which is also, by the way, the name of a famous cocktail. Queen Mary's successor was Queen Elizabeth I, another daughter from Henry VIII, and she was uh, a Protestant. She managed to largely put an end to, I mean at least for a while, to religious tensions in England by creating a Church of England which would be um, a kind of middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism. Middle way means that some elements of Protestant churches were taken, but also elements from the Catholic uh, tradition. For example, the Mass and the Bible were to be delivered and read in English. Okay, uh, We can consider it to be a, an element of modernity, uh, as well as a religious element, and also you know, something political. It's also a way for the state to impose English language. Um, you must understand that uh, English was not spoken all over the kingdom. In many peripheral rural areas, people spoke, you know, some local languages uh, and Celtic languages in Wales and um, in, in, in Scotland, even though Scotland was not in the kingdom at that moment. So imposing English was also something political. Churches could be decorated and uh, the clergy of the Church of England was to be an organized clergy, you know, with, with bishops and priests, a, a hierarchy. Um, so uh, you really have this uh, uh, mixed form of religion. But no other church than the Church of England was to be tolerated. So uh, that was... Uh, a very brilliant, uh, I would say, and, and uh, strongly political strategy. Uh, you, you, you can understand, consequently, why, e even though uh, the Church of England is not a Catholic Church, uh, why many churches look Catholic? Uh, it is because um, uh, of this middle way created by Elizabeth, one of the very important monarchs in the history of Britain. Westminster Abbey, uh, most important um, church in England, which is in London, which is where the, the crowning of the uh, kings and queens takes place. It is um, a, a very massive Gothic style um, church, obviously. So more Catholic than Protestant in terms of architecture. And lastly, uh, another but very specific form of reformation uh, must be uh, examined now. It's, it's what the Catholic Church did uh, as a reaction to uh, this incredible uh, religious upheaval that had taken place. Well, in fact, the Catholic Church reacted rather quickly and uh, her counter-reformation is rather easy to understand. You must remember that uh, what had appalled uh, a man like Luther was the um, development of uh, an extreme wealth of the Catholic Church and the celebration of the power and wealth of the Pope and his Church as a celebration of God. The, the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome uh, with notably the Sistine Chapel 
personal chapel of the Pope painted by Michelangelo uh, is a good illustration of this uh, uh, celebration of wealth and power. And so, and so because this was what the Protestants blamed the Catholics for, obviously, there was a long religious meeting known as the Council of Trent. Trent is a city in northern Italy that took place for 20 years in the middle of the century. And this is where decisions were made in order to organize the Catholic counter-offensive in a way. And basically what the Catholic Church decided was that everything the Protestant blamed the Catholic for had to be reinforced uh, as a kind of celebration of Catholic pride. In terms of art, it led to the spreading of a new form of art based on excess, excess of detail, excess of movement, excess of color. It is what we call Baroque art and many churches in Rome uh, are great illustrations of this Baroque art, which is a good illustration, I think, of this Catholic reaction. Uh, they basically said to their faithful, well, the Protestant promote uh, austerity and uh, an individual religion. We, the Catholic Church, um, we want to shake hearts and we want to impress and uh, we want to celebrate God. Uh, that is, I think, the message chosen by the Catholic Church. It accepted to be rich, it accepted to be powerful and offensive, and Baroque art is a good illustration of that. You can see here uh, examples taken from a church in Rome called the Church of the Gesù, the Church of Jesus. And uh, what is interesting is that this church, this church is the, uh, the home of a new organization within uh, the Catholic Church called the Society of Jesus, led by um, a monk from Spain called Ignatius de Loyola. Um, the, the Society of Jesus was accepted by the Pope, which is what is illustrated here, uh, in order to, to be a very offensive organization of missionaries whose role was to spread Catholicism anywhere it was possible. And in particular, the Society of Jesus was extremely active in America, in the Spanish colonies in particular, in order to spread very successfully, we must uh, admit, the Catholic religion here. Um, the Catholic Church tried to improve itself, to improve the training of its priest, because it was decided not to be destroyed by Protestant churches. So in the history of Christian religion and also in the history in art and politics, we can say that this Renaissance was an extremely important historical period for Europe and also for the world.